I am confident that uh, at all times I acted with integrity, I acted ethically. We still have lots of questions about why the government was so afraid of the truth coming to light. Why did the Liberals hide vital information from the prosecution, the defence and from the rest of Canadians? The process involved in, uh, in a public prosecution like this is entirely independent uh, of my office. The case against Vice Admiral Mark Norman may be over, but the political fallout is still very much going on. So which party stands to benefit, if, if any, and, and where do we go from here at issue? Here to dig into that and a little bit more, Chantal Hébert is in Montreal, Andrew Coyne in Toronto, and Shachi Curl joins us from Vancouver tonight. Good to see everyone. Uh, so this is one of these cases that had been bubbling away, uh, a little bit hard to understand, I think, because it was deep in sort of procurement talk, and then just suddenly ended this week. Um, does anyone come out, other than uh, Vice Admiral Norman, does anyone come out ahead politically in this? Uh, Chantal, I'll start with you. Uh, I don't think anybody comes out really ahead politically. I suspect that the Liberals uh, are probably relieved uh, that this is going to be behind them before the election campaign because they could have had to campaign throughout the uh, next fall against the backdrop of testimony uh, that they had no control over, involving some of their own people, former ministers, clerks, go down the list. So it would have been a nightmare for them. That, that the fact that the charges are dropped does not validate their position. But I don't think there's enough traction to this to keep it going for until as long as the SNC-Lavalin, for instance. Yeah, well, Andrew, that's a, that's a good question. Be because it is sort of complex, and you raised all the unanswered questions today in your column, but it, does that allow the Liberals a little bit more breathing space away from this? And because there's nothing that you can sort of point to and say, oh, you did that wrong. No, I mean, it's not as uh, complicated, perhaps, as uh, SNC Laughlin. It's still pretty simple, though, that they, they basically, this guy, the, the Vice Admiral Norman, was basically put under a cloud for two years, dragged through the muck uh, in what looks like a very thin case that ultimately collapsed. So, yeah, they don't have to go through the trial, it looks like, but there's still a lot of these questions that have to be answered about why was the defense able to get this information that essentially made the case collapse and neither the police nor the prosecution had it? Why was the government so um, weirdly reluctant to release basic documents that the prosecution, that the defense was, was seeking? Why were there these strange meetings where nobody took any notes when they were discussing matters like should we fire the, the, the second in command of the, of the military? And indeed, why did this thing go to uh, go to trial in the first place, or why was it about to go to trial? Yeah. Um, you know, there's no doubt about it. The, the starting point for this was the government referring uh, charges to the RCMP. The RCMP had a choice whether or not to investigate, but I think well, P P PCO referring charges. PCO, just to be, well, and, just but, to be 100 percent accurate. Again, part of the government, and indeed, as we've seen. Uh, in, in recent times, there's real questions about just how independent and nonpartisan the PCO is or was under Michael Wernick. Yes. So there's questions that come out of that. And as I say, if you're the, the senior officer of the RCMP and this is handed to you, you may well think this might be a career-limiting move if I don't proceed with this. So I think there's still a lot of questions. And one avenue that we may see yeah. it explored in is if Vice Admiral uh, Norman decides to bring a lawsuit against yeah. the government. And yeah. that'll be one of the questions to be seen. Although, I mean, when you're reading how the case unfolded, uh, I certainly had questions as to what the RCMP was actually doing. It, it, you know, if they didn't speak to Vice Admiral Norman, they didn't speak to anyone in the Conservatives. Exactly. It, it's a curious uh, investigation in terms of how complete it was. Shut you weigh in on, on what you think the fallout from this actually is. So you had asked about if there are any winners. I don't think there are, but I think there's one big loser, and again, that is the Trudeau government. This just adds to sort of the drip, drip, drip that carries over from the SNC scandal and the unanswered questions about that. So, you know, Chantal and Andrew, you've talked about they've tried to cauterize the wound a little bit, end it early, yes. But at this point, the details don't matter. What Scott Bryson did or didn't do or what PCO did or didn't do that may or may not have been inappropriate does not have a lot of bearing on people trying to follow this story. Their 10-second takeaway is that 
they no longer are predisposed to give this government the benefit of the doubt based on what they saw in the first quarter of this year. Remember when we all used to marvel about Justin Trudeau's approval numbers being at 65 percent? Well, now his disapproval is at 67 percent. So there isn't a lot of willingness, I think, within the public to say, oh, well, maybe, maybe they didn't do anything with this one, or maybe everything was on the up and up. And the other factor is uh, Vice Admiral Norman has not had his say yet. He has not yes, told yeah. the entirety of his story. It's only going to add to a really tight timeline that Trudeau has and his government has to try and sort of staunch or stop the wound and try to start healing. And it, it looks at this point today like he might be running out of time. Chantal, what, okay. what do you think? Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I don't disagree with any of that, but it was a lose-lose. Uh, it's lose this week or lose over the course of the campaign. Uh, and the, yes, I, I agree that uh, everyone is going to be curious to hear uh, what comes next in this story. But there are also, uh, and to go back to your point, Rosie, <laughs> questions to be asked of the RCMP. Mm -hmm. uh, you would think that on the heels of what happened with the Mike Duffy trial, there yes. would be a test that the RCMP and the prosecutors would put to themselves when politics collides with what may be criminal or what may be uh, inappropriate behavior. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't seem like that test was applied or that due diligence was done. It is surprising, amazing, that the RCMP never talked to uh, people from the Harper era when they, some of their charges, went back to that era. So, yes. yes, lots of questions, not only of the Trudeau government. L last word to you on this, and then I'll uh, switch topics. Well, just to amplify something Sachi said, you know, it, it, we're in, almost in a campaign mode now. And oftentimes when these things explode during a campaign, it's not the direct damage that's done that really hurts the party. It's the robbing, they're robbed of time to get their own message, to get their own themes out. Point. And the yep. Liberals are now in a position where they're starting from seven, eight points behind. They need to start getting their own message out, and this is just going to continue to frustrate their ability to do that. Okay, I, I want to switch to uh, this week's Green Party victory in Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Uh, it's something everyone, I know all of you have thought about and written about. Some, some analysis, not yours, but other people, maybe overblown because <laughs> it is a by-election, but let's, let's weigh in on, on whether this actually matters. But first, here's the uh, leader of the Green Party obviously celebrating. The target is to be effective uh, to achieve what must be achieved for the future of our children and grandchildren. The only way to do that is, frankly, if it's a minority parliament where there are enough Greens elected to hold whoever we can work with to account. So good news for the Green Party, Shachi, but there was lots of other news that the other parties have to digest in some way as well out of what happened. What we saw in this by-election and what we're seeing in terms of the public mood is also a bleed of the, the progressive left or the left of centre to parties away from the Liberals and the NDP, which have been the traditional homes for people who are left of centre. The Greens continue to be the only party that have clean hands on the climate change file, in part because they've never governed, but still. Uh, if you are a past Liberal voter who voted because of the climate change promise, and now you're ticked off because of pipelines and tankers, you now have a natural home with Elizabeth May and the and the Greens. Plus, there is the added credibility of MLAs in British Columbia, in Ontario, in New Brunswick, in Prince Edward Island. So where four years ago, uh, the opposition leaders might have said, or Jagmeet Singh, the Prime Minister, might have said, uh, a vote for the Greens is a vote for the Conservatives. Yes. In fact, there is some credibility now behind her argument that a vote for the Greens could actually just be a vote for the Greens. Chantal. Well, uh, listening to that clip, you, what you hear is uh, the Green Party offering to take up the position that the NDP used to claim uh, as in the conscience of Parliament, not the power. Uh, uh, and that uh, speaks to the trouble that the NDP is in, yes. that when the issue is climate, it is really hard for them to position themselves in that way. Uh, and the results uh, were certainly terrible news for the NDP. It was an NDP seat. Yes. It's going to make it harder for Mr. Singh to keep his party united. You've already got Sven Robinson, who is going to be running in the next campaign, saying that uh, Jagmeet Singh has to take firm, firm positions against some of the energy projects that the NDP and BC uh, has signed up for. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also agree that uh, for the Liberals, it is a clear signal that, that they are bleeding to the Green Party, that they're, and that the votes from the NDP that they counted on, because the NDP is weak, maybe going somewhere else. So that's bad news to uh, Sashi's list uh, of yeah. 
Greens, I would add Quebec Solidaire, uh, yes. whose campaign was right. really a green campaign, and it really paid off. And, and the NDP have now lost two uh, of their former seats, Outremont and this one, two in, in just over two months. Andrew. We all like to caution ourselves not to read too much into by-election results, but when a Green Party is winning a seat, when the governing party is finishing fourth in good economic times, um, something's afoot. Part of that is, as mentioned, that people are more willing to look further afield now to vote for parties they didn't vote for before. But part of it is, as uh, Chantal was mentioning, the, the fragmentation on the left. There's two ways in which the Liberals can traditionally corral that vote on the left within the Liberal camp. One is to have a really inspiring uh, leader and campaign on the Liberal side, and they, we saw a bit of that in 2015 where they were able to get people to come over to them. The other is to really frighten people with the Tories and to say you have to vote for us to, to stay out of the, uh, to, to keep the Tories out. Well, people aren't going to be terribly inspired uh, on the left to vote for Justin Trudeau this time around. There's, there's been too much disillusionment since then. Uh, and it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with the Tories. You can certainly see that the Liberals are ginning up to try and, and run a fear campaign about the Tories, about what they represent. Uh, Andrew Shear's got, I think, a real, both a challenge and an opportunity, therefore, to try and prevent the Liberals from making such a, demonizing them to such an extent that they can unify that vote on the left. And so it'll be interesting to see with these five speeches he's giving, whether that will be part of what he tries to do is to make himself less scary to centrist voters. And we're going to talk more about that in the podcast. So thanks for that free tease, Andrew Coyne. Mm -hmm. and, and one more thing I want to mention before we go. Uh, last weekend at the press gallery dinner, our very own a gal right here, oh. Chantel, won the, <laughs> she's going to hate me after this. She won the Charles Lynch Award for Outstanding Public Affairs Coverage, one of the most uh, prominent awards you can get in journalism. So our congratulations to you, Chantel. You well know, deserved. Well you. done. That's Yay, right. We're happy to have you here. Yay, Chantel. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. Uh, before we go, be sure to subscribe to add issues of podcast for extra content. Andrew hinted at what it is this week. Uh, we are talking about Andrew Shear's foreign policy pitch, one of a handful of speeches he's giving over the next number of weeks. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national.